Um, I'd like to start off by just asking each of you uh, what this word means. What is cosmopolitanism? Because I think uh, in, in my own judgment, it's been falsely identified with multiculturalism, uh, but I, I feel that it's something different. And I wonder if you can just, uh, Arjun, would you like to kick off? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here uh, for this part, anyway, of uh, this uh, remarkable three-day uh, conference. Uh, so on the question uh, that uh, you've put before us, uh, Rana, yes, I do think the, the word is uh, sometimes used more loosely uh, and uh, possibly uh, with uh, some more lightness of semantic being than it should be. Uh, so my view of cosmopolitanism, which uh, initially tells you a bit about how I think of the word, is that it is any uh, serious effort, either by a person or in my case, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, the group or a group which uh, sees the need, one way or the other, to uh, extend its uh, prior cultural boundaries. So just the effort to get beyond, as opposed to the idea of it as something, you know, which gives you a bird's eye view or is based on ideas of uh, tolerance and inclusion and so on. I think it's more the striving to get to the border of what you know, culturally speaking, and push to the other side, whatever the other side might be. So that's a very f preliminary first cut on what I think the word should mean, uh, as opposed to what it tends to mean. And, um Jamie? Um, just to add to, to uh, uh, what Arjun said is that um, in large Euro-Asian cities in pre-modern times, and I would say the post-Mongolian uh, times, we have this fascination with Genghis Khan in my field, uh, there has been an extraordinary diversity of cultures and uh, ethnicities and lifestyles in Mughal Empire, in Central Asia, in Safavid and the Ottoman. And, um, and even though there was not a, a particular theoretization of cosmopolitanism, what, when we look back, what we observe is, is that people we uh, sort out as Muslim, Christian, Jew had much more complex and rich life as uh, a part of living in big cities and big towns in conversation with their neighbors coming from different backgrounds. And uh, we were assuming that they just found this diversity and tolerated or condoned even though they didn't like the diversity. But looking back, we could also see many examples where uh, both the, the public and the imperial elites, they cherished it, they yes. preserved, they were very proud of it. Uh, and we see examples of, 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 let's say, an Armenian and a Turk writing a poem about a Jewish girl, or, and they call it that way, um, or they share uh, similar music, uh, similar taste in poetry. Um, in, in, in the Mughal uh, case in India, with, with India's diversity, of course, you can see multiple versions of it. And, and the, of course, the question is that they don't uh, theorize this. It's kind of uh, naturally happening, even though they are proud of it. Only with nationalism, I guess, is that when they were trying to theorize this and they got into more trouble, I think that's one of the uh, questions that we are struggling with. Why did uh, uh, empires in the 19th century has more problem with diversity even when they were trying to codify it or preserve it compared to the earlier times. So the, the word obviously has the cosmos buried in it. So to what extent does the idea of the cos cosmopolitan include the idea of the universal, not simply just an attempt to expand one's boundaries slightly, but an attempt to think about the self and mm. the, the, the political community from the point of view of the universal, the all-embracing? Uh, well, I think, yes, the etymology has cosmos and polis. Uh, 
The second part is also important because it recognizes that there's something political about this. It's not just about lifestyles and blending and mixing. It's about somehow co-living uh, in a governable or sustainable manner. So that's the police part. But the cosmos part, I think, it's, it's serious uh, universalism, implied universalism, is uh, uh, evolving artifact of the Western construction, uh, the Western uh, long-term construction, but also the liberal construction, and especially uh, the construction once, paradoxically, the world came to be under the European writ. So uh, I think this is a tricky problem in its own right, and I'm trying to reflect on it independently. The kind of Kantian idea that all good things are actually universal things, and the global writ of European powers in the world have a, a, a worrisome uh, chronological connection in the 17th and 18th centuries. So, so I think the universality part is, in fact, if you wish, strangely particular. And I think in other places, it really does not, so far as the word is a useful word in whatever translation. And that, too, is a question some would ask, you know, why not just ditch the damn thing? Uh, ditch the word, I think still it's worth keeping because it speaks to some kind of yearning, both among rulers and among ordinary people, to stretch right. their cultural horizons. And I think that is often not connected to anything about the universal. It's really about pushing out and, uh, and encountering and engaging and so on. It, it doesn't have to do with a map of the globe or a sense of the universal, in my view, except in this particular uh, Western uh, European trajectory, where mm. it re demands somehow that it be true at all times for all people in the same way. Even though I agree, I want to add to this is that um, the, the cosmology, the cosmos, is, uh, is quite expensive in some of the imperial cities of, of the areas of Eurasia. The, for example, the cosmology of the Mughal emperors, um, thinking that they are providing this universal justice, exactly. and the notion that the, the, in, under their domain, uh, a lion and a lamb uh, will live in peace. And in fact, they, I think from what I read from, from Aspar Moin's book, a millennial sovereignty, since some of the Mughal emperors actually raised a lion and a lamb together and went to the markets with it to prove that they have this, um, uh, the, the cosmological peace that they provide under their domain. Um, and as you said, th this is not necessarily universal, but if you think about, uh, let's say, Chinese Muslim bureaucrats in the Ming or Qing Empire, someone who is familiar with, uh, with the Confucian culture, the Chinese tradition, uh, as, they, as Muslim, they're the Muslim culture, but in conversation with the Jesuit, with Christianity, that person already has an amazing diversity of, of universes, intellectual traditions. And, um, and, and we know, for example, the, the European merchants who went to India, they did note the, 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 the question of diversity and the tolerance as a positive thing for trade. And, and, um, and some, there is some prediction that John Locke's idea of toleration Mm. Is, is actually inspired by this accounts, not necessarily plagiarized, but inspired, I will say, by the accounts of European merchants and travelers observing that these rich areas of India or the Ottoman lands or China are actually also very diverse and, and very um, inclusive and very tolerant. Um, I, but this is not necessarily thinking that there's one single truth and that's applicable to everywhere. Yes. Uh, even though uh, the stories of Alexander the Great uh, or Genghis Khan are circulating, uh, in addition to stories of Abbasid Empire. So a very well-educated uh, bureaucrat, a munshi in Delhi or um, in, in the Mughal court, will have very different intellectual traditions already merged in his mind. Um, but what does, you know, is that 
is that cosmopolitan is, is a debate we need to think about. It. Well, if I can add a word to uh, Jamil's uh, absolutely correct observation, I think what it leads me to uh, recall and think that we all would be well served by recalling it is that universality is uh, a very specific and demanding kind of uh, point of view, and that you can have ideas of the world and its desirability, the world in all its diversity and its desirability, really from any point on the globe. And, right. and in fact, the one of the worst uh, flaws in uh, contemporary, particularly Western studies of areas and regions and civilizations and comparison and so on, is the idea that in the Euro-American Euro West, there's a kind of unique capacity to uh, think about the world. And that's conflated with universalism, with Western universalism, which is a particular point of view, and makes little room, even today, for the ideas that people have worlds that they inhabit in their minds, what I have elsewhere called imagined worlds. Nobody lives only in their place. Everybody is imagining some kind of world, however lopsided it might be. All of them are lopsided anyway. Uh, but I think this is the piece that, <coughs> or the observation, that adds further weight to what Jamil is saying, which is you can have a, a very great variety of empires, states, even publics, that do imagine a world beyond their yeah. circumscribed. But they may not place on it the demand that it uh, conform <clears throat> to some idea of universality. In other words, universality here is the peculiar idea. It's specific, it's very... It makes lots of special demands, and most people don't see any need for it, but that doesn't mean they're encased in a kind of regional bubble or in a, a monocultural bubble. They certainly are not, and Jimmy is absolutely right about that. So um, I just want to say to the audience that what we have up on the screen, uh, though uh, Arjun is drinking a glass of white wine and I'm on water, uh, what we have up on the screen is a scene from an Ottoman coffee house, mm. um, and it refers to uh, some of the things that Jamil was saying in his presentation yesterday about the invention of the coffee house as a cosmopolitan space uh, in the Ottoman Empire before it became a European a symbol of European cosmopolitanism and, and modernity. But um, I want to turn to the other term in our in our title, which is that of empire. So the title is "Have Nations Killed Cosmopolitanism." Um, and how might that be the case, and what would be the evidence for it? Were empires more cosmopolitan in, than, than the smaller units that they broke up into? Um, the, the, I, I guess I, I work on the, some of the early modern empires. I just want to uh, maybe start the conversation with one um, anecdote of, uh, in 1300, um, Mughal origin king of Persia, Ilhanid kingdom, Ghazan Khan converted to Islam. And, and just before that moment, we know that uh, the, this uh, Mughal empire had really inclusive policies. I mean, despite the fact that you have to buy into the idea that Genghis Khan is sacred, uh, one policy was that, uh, that uh, every uh, religious community is tax exempt, whether you are a shaman, Muslim, Christian, uh, uh, Jew, uh, that you don't pay taxes. And in a way that the Mughal imperial administration treats different religions on an equal basis. And in that context, when Ghazan Khan became Muslim, he wanted to increase in the Middle East his legitimacy in the eyes of Muslim publics. And there might be other reasons why he became Muslim. Um, but he was also fighting with the Mamluks. So the, the Ibn Taymiyyah, um, one of the intellectuals from Damascus, uh, who was more attached to Memluks, wrote a couple of critiques of, of Ghazan Khan, saying that 
um, your Muslimness doesn't count because you treat uh, uh, a Muslim cleric equal to a shaman priest, equal to a, a, a Jew. And the Ghazan Khan's response is very complicated. He says, well, it doesn't violate my Muslimness, and this is how you stand. You know, I, I run a big imperial business here, and I cannot privilege one religious community over others. But we forget, looking back, I mean, people think that Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, legal critique of Ghazan Khan uh, became dominant. Actually, the opposite. Uh, right. For the following thousand years, it was actually Ghazan Khan's practice was the dominant practice. So sort of different empires uh, improved or polished their craft of administration and rule, which was never perfect. The, the ideal of inclusive empire was never perfect. There was always somebody who was more privileged. Um, but empire at least provided a space of, of diverse people to uh, move around, interact, learn from each other, cross the borders. And empires were, were, were not uh, insecure. Um, they were not paranoid. They, they, they didn't see, um, they didn't see uh, the Armenian merchant networks extended from the Ottomans, the Safavids, to Europe, to Mughal Empire. They didn't see them as a fifth column, as a threat to one of the empire. It's actually good to have these connections. Somebody needs to do the trade. Um, but at some point, of course, in, in the late 19th century, these trans-imperial, trans-border connections began to be seen as a liability rather than an asset. Uh, and it's a big puzzle why, when. Um, I think that might be one of the questions behind uh, the, the topic. You know, when, when did this logic of the nation state that began to see uh, diversity as a liability rather than an asset? Yeah, no, I think that's a very useful uh kind of compared to observation about the pre-modern and the, the, let's say, modern period, which is also the nation state period. And I think Rana's question uh, pushes us to think about these terms, you know, empire and nation state. And I've always found it interesting based on my not expert knowledge of empires and my better knowledge of the nation state system to think that among the many differences, and they are many, uh, in the journey from the one to the other in different parts of the world, that it's always helpful to recall that most empires of which I'm aware usually don't care about boundaries of their sovereignty. They are frontiers, but frontier really means it's an expansive, elastic space. Yeah. The key is the center the palace, the forbidden city, the court. So it radiates this way, and the edges can be blurred, and there's no problem. The nation state works the opposite. Of course, it has capitals, but the key is the border, not the boundary, the border. A line in the sand, or in Vaga, or wherever. Mm -hmm. Nation states, uh, and, and of course, there's a ton of theory about this, but I think the essence is that nation states see themselves on a flat plane uh, where they are similar to each other, and where a line divides their authority. And guarding that line is crucial. And all these diversities, whether they're mercantile or other, are seen as leakages that threaten that boundary. And today, of course, in Trump's world or in the EU, wherever, we see that the site of paranoia is the border. It's, Yes, of course, it's London when the, these attacks happen or this and that, but essentially it's about the in and out, the line. Empires don't have this, but that said, I think there's another sticky, well, there are two other quick things to observe. One is that, in my view at least, the modern nation state is unthinkable without some idea of national essence, which quickly becomes an ethnic essence, a cultural essence, and so on. Empires have many things, but that doesn't seem to be one of them. It's, it's the writ of the emperor. It can, anybody can be in it, including animals and so on. But it's not about are you X or are you Y. The question of are you Mughal or are you Ottoman doesn't have the same quality as are you German, are you Indian, and so on. Of course. So there's an essence problem. But the, the, the other final quick thought I have is this reminds us that cosmopolitanism, alas, is not, uh, does not require as the ground of its 
of its thriving, you know, democracy, equality, uh, lack of territorial ambition, uh, uh, sort of niceness to all under your writ. Empires can be very nasty, both in court politics yeah. and generally. But in this regard, this is not a point of anxiety for them. Nations uh, on the other side can be deeply obsessed with at least the image of their being democratic, just, fair, lateral, equal, and so on. But they can't tolerate you know, this idea that someone disturbs their essence, their national essence, which is actually a cultural essence, which quickly becomes a racial and ethnic as it's empires, to my mind, the ones I know, that's not part of their problem. They have many others, which is why we have to be careful, I think, about uh, looking back too uh, positively at the cosmopolitan of empires. It's genuine, but it went along with lots of other things which are less fun. <laughs> Yes, because I think in contemporary terms, if you were to ask what is the opposite of cosmopolitanism, someone might say a racist. But actually, those two things are not contradictory at all. I think many no. cosmopolitans were highly racist. They were highly engaged and familiar with uh, other modes of being. And this is one of the things that empire promoted. Uh, exactly as you say, uh, Arjun, I think that um, the, the point of empires is that they were they, they had no natural boundaries. Exactly. Anyone could be included. Um, and in that sense, um, they excluded nothing either. They were not based on the idea that so-and-so can never be part of our empire yeah, because of right. their ethnicity <coughs> or whatever. And in this sense, I think um, when, we, when we look at what, what, how nations try to solve the same problem, which is with, with ideologies of multiculturalism or whatever, we realize that these are far smaller in their ambition. Uh, multiculturalism essentially says, let everyone understand different people so that they may live alongside them. Empires don't say that. They say, no one will ever understand each other because our empire is far too vast and too varied, and no one in, in this space will ever have the capacity to know how all these modes of life work, but they must coexist anyway. And coexistence based on non-understanding seems to me to have much more potential than coexistence based on understanding, because that relies on a lot of understanding. That, Rana, is a great point. Uh, some years ago, I had to give some talk uh, at some UNESCO forum, good one, on tolerance and so on, or these very issues. And I wrote something on um, the risks when you have negotiation, for example, between Christi Christian uh, institutions and Muslim ones in Europe, even in the best liberal spirit. Uh, and that is that when these negotiations occur, precisely what is asked for is too much understanding. So that, let's say, you're from the Muslim world, I'm from the Christian world. When we sit at the table to have some negotiation, typically, I will, the first thing I'll ask you is, do you believe in jihad? You know, something like that. My, my point is, leave it off that table. <laughs> what, do, do you need the, what you regard as the Just core, drink coffee. As the core <laughs> conviction to be the, point of, the first point of discussion? So not understanding that is just fine. Because again, this demand that we must have consensus yes. on our most cherished and therefore most different views before we discuss small things like veils, hats, uniforms, bikinis. My feeling is stick to the hats and bikinis. You'll go a long way or diet or this or that. Do not ask, do you think Jesus is the son of God? For sure, you know, uh, etc. <laughs> that is absurd. It's the demand for too much understanding. So I'm totally with you that we need to be humbler <laughs> about the degree of understanding that's required for Cohabitation. This is another very deep, I think, uh, habit that has evolved in this part of the world, which is that genuine cohabitation, co-living, what some call conviviality, requires that kind of unlimited, full, and basic agreement. Right. The truth is it doesn't. Yes. You can have a small agreement and get along fine. Um, 
I'm saying this in only uh, after I agree with you uh, that maybe less knowledge is better. And I have experienced this uh, when I was visiting Malaysia. As a Muslim, I wanted to go to a Hindu festival and I wanted to bring some of my Malay friends. And they were surprised. They said, why do you want to go to a Hindu festival? And I said, I'm curious. I'm white, I guess. As a, as a camera, as I, now I realize I, I look so stupid at that point, I guess. With a big camera, this is 1990s. And they actually, one of them came with me. And it's not me that attracted attention that a Malay Muslim coming to a Hindu festival that I could see the, the, the kind of Hindu Malays mm. were looking at why, why, is he, why is he here? You know, that, that's not something you do, I assume. Um, but in Singapore, uh, on the other hand, um, in Singapore they have a law that, that you're not supposed to offend any uh, other religious community. There's a, there's a law about it. So I'm saying this only in, in, in the sense of uh, uh, not restorative nostalgia, but reflective nostalgia. That um, yes, there are the empires that uh, good practices, but it may be impossible to replicate it. Yes. Uh, in the in, the, in today's world, uh, even though a full understanding is impossible, we may need to give some sort of understanding and respect about each other, and and ex teach uh, the citizens that. Uh, that difference is okay. A different person uh, not, doesn't necessarily mean um, he has less right. Uh, and that part of education, now I'm living in America, then I feel like it should be part of the, the national educational curriculum. Um, even just to say that different people are okay may be enough. You don't need to know what, what they are. But I think I see in America, and I don't know how it happens, you know, just uh, the. the <laughs> my fat Greek wedding scene, and a girl eating Greek food, moussaka, and then the other girls are making fun of her. That may seem the innocent version in the movie. Um, but that, you know, eventually nation states create a dominant majoritarian um, culture that then privileges those people. So the Singapore privileges the Chinese, people who can speak Chinese language. Malaysia privileges uh, Malays. Um, and, I, and, and, it, and we may need to then go beyond that to find a solution um, around it, since we cannot go back to the imperial uh, version, yeah. to make sure that a Chinese in Malaysia and a Malay in China, uh, Singapore uh, do not uh, feel underprivileged or excluded. Um, so that, I think, is, is one of the puzzles to, for, for the nation states to kind of recreate that respect and equality and dignity in the context of the new uh, notion mm. of citizenship and majority-minority cultural context. Well, the, 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 the reference to my fat Greek wed wedding or whatever it is, uh, is is part of the problem, right? It's about how uh, uh, cultural and religious and ethnic minorities uh, in a multicultural society think only about the fact that they are part of that yeah. minority. They have nothing, no other thought on their mind, and all they ever do in their, their culture, their literature, their films, is just talk endlessly. Thank you very, oh, very much. Why? Well, we can share this. <laughs> I, I can see it on other... Converting from coffee. Um, and so uh, you have, uh, you know, writers of... Uh, uh, American writers of, of, of Indian origin, or yeah. of, of, of whatever origin, writing endless books about how they, they are of Indian origin. <laughs> Um, um, and I think that's one of the, the, the problems we face in America, that different cheers. ethnic minorities try to be white without uh, making alliances with each other, right? The, the, uh, the Irish became white and the Jews became white. And, and then everybody <laughs> always thought about themselves. And then the South Asians and the Muslims tried to be white too until they <laughs> faced the pushback. And, and now the, the colleagues in Islamic studies write a lot about it. It's, it's just uh, the generation of South Asian Muslims or the Turks and Arabs um, did not create the necessary conversation alliance with African Americans or Irish or Hindu or Chinese uh -huh. Buddhist Americans um, when they really needed to do that. And they, were, they thought that th this whole multiculturalism is about only my community and the dominant majority community. Yeah, and then. Um, but instead of finding a kind of a different solution to the problem, they only thought about their own problems. So the Greeks eventually became white too, thanks to Christianity or whatever. Uh, even though 20 but years really, ago... You know, this raises another little embarrassment yeah. for all of us, which is that these communities say in the U.S., about which are 100% right, 
you know, they all want to become model minorities, yeah. which means relating to the majority, uh, not each other, is hard to dissociate from the uh, traditions of racism that they already bring. Yeah. So, you know, Indians are notoriously racist yeah. about Africans and darker-hued people. Uh, we know, alas, that people in East Asia see Indians as somewhat brown, therefore verging on black. So in short, there's a little embarrassment that other parts of the world for a long time have had their own versions of hierarchy with a nasty biological subtext, which is available then to these minorities also in the US, yeah. or put another way, from which freeing yourself is not very easy. It's easier to become whiter rather than to become darker or some kind of a blended palette, you know, where suddenly oh, brown and that yellow can become, you know, some kind of rich beige. This is not part of the tradition which we have. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, there's a ton of politics involved in why people go this way rather than that way, why they, they don't identify. And they also don't identify, in the case of the Indian minority in the U.S., Typically, your Indian uh, software engineer will not be identifying with the Indian taxi cab driver. Yes. It's a class issue, too. So I want to be in you know, Westchester or wherever in Silicon Valley. That's me yeah. and the other me's. Mm -hmm. But it's not my brethren who are you know, making naan or driving taxis or serving as nurses. So there's that little problem as well. So there's a, it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> I. I heard uh, a fascinating presentation on uh, on the cosmopolitanism of London in the period before the Second World War, um, and where where people like as varied in their politics as uh, T. S. Eliot, H. G. Wells, Orwell, um, uh, from both the right and the left, uh, were part of a, a the forgotten. Um, uh, internationalism of, of literature in London at that time, among whom there were many Indian and Caribbean writers and artists, but also from many other places in the world that had nothing to do with the British Empire, including China. Um, hmm. And there was a comment by, um, by Wells at a certain point, who had been uh, friendly with many of these, these, uh, these figures, and um, had been very involved in the, the struggle for Indian independence and had uh, written about the fact, along with many of his other Bloomsbury colleagues, such as uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Wolfs, about the need for Indian independence and the fact that this was part of a project of world liberation. It was not just about India becoming a nation, it was about liberation from yeah. the whole legacy of European empire and the inauguration of new kinds of realities which we didn't know what they would be yet. In 1947, when India became independent, a lot of those Indian writers and artists went to India from London and they decided to become bureaucrats of various sorts in Nehru's government. And a lot of the London figures who were left behind were completely shocked and dismayed that these people who had been in London suddenly d decided to be Indian. They were never Indian, they were cosmop cosmopolites. They were part of a global project to liberate the world of which the liberation of India was only one part. Uh, their decision to become national figures yeah. and to have national uh, authority within, the, within Nehru's government was a very disappointing decision to a lot of the people that were left behind. And to me, that illustrates something about what we might be talking about in this, between the transition from empire to nation, that London was not just a center of people who ruled the rest of the world. It was a center that received the rest of the world and, be, and forged a, a, a global culture out of it. So my last question, because I want to open it up to uh, the audience, is a very simple one. If, since there are conceivably, in the old sense at least, no empires left, does that mean there are no cosmopolitan places left? What is the most cosmopolitan place you know? Well, I think of the two cities that I know somewhat, uh, one very well and one only now, Bombay, later Mumbai, but that's B for Bombay, and B for Berlin. Uh, I'm sure there are many others, uh, and many I don't know, but I think they, these are places where 
in spite of many pulls in the other direction, that is towards elimination, towards cleansing, towards monoculturalism and so on, there is a, a general uh, sort of interest, commitment, both among ordinary people and uh, among uh, leaders, though not without contestation, to the idea that movement, flow, difference, alterity, as they say these days, is, is a good thing. The interesting, and I think what underlies that is that big cities, by and large, globally, increasingly pull away from their national hinterlands. That is, they have a life of their own, either because they're global financial capitals or something. They just don't dance always to the national tune. They have some logic of their own. In the case of Bombay, now Mumbai, I think the core of it is commercial. Money moves, money creates contact between classes, people, tribes, groups. It's, it's, it's the fluid that keeps hard lines soft. In Berlin, all of you here can tell me what it is, but I have a feeling it's not commerce, because it's not, uh, this is not uh, Munich, uh, it's not Köln, uh, but nor is it, you know, Göttingen or Heidelberg, it's, it's a big, complex city. I think it has something to do with, I say this now as a total leap into things of which I should not speak, but <laughs> among friends I can. I think this has something to do with unification, this has something to do with art, culture, and institutions like this, which exist and thrive because there's something that they speak to in their urban populations. So, yeah, I think it's good to look at cities because cities have a logic, political, economic, cultural, artistic, aesthetic, which is never fully owned by either empires or states. So I look to cities, although we know notoriously from a million studies, among which are studies that even I have contributed to, that cities are increasingly homes of inequality, injustice, global markets, finance, all true. But if you want to look at a type of setting which has some chinks in it, because it's not completely uh, owned by larger entities, it has to be large cities. And our problem becomes, how to make large cities otherwise habitable. But I don't think we have to import into large cities the idea that variety is a good thing. Mm. And, and to add to uh, your praise for Berlin, <laughs> I will just say, I come here every summer, I, I will just say that, that I see uh, also a positive And for HKV, for yeah. this place. <laughs> uh, I see a positive <laughs> development of, of also colleagues and, and uh, a lot of Berliners, others are moving from this model of integration and assimilation. I, I, I used yes. to come to Germany to visit my relatives who were guest workers and then became mm -hmm. citizens. Um, and as Turkish uh, residents and then became citizens of this place, even the most good intentioned pro-Turkish German discourses uh, assume that in one or two generation they will assimilate. But the assimilation of course assumes that there is a core, a good core, these are foreigners are coming in. It relies on this idea of, of, a, of an essential European German culture, and these are aliens. Of course, historians or humanities scholars will, will, will shatter all of this. What is the essential German culture? What is, uh, Germany have always been global, very connected in, in, in different True. ways. And, and the people who came already came from with their own rich traditions. And it, it, it puts even the very good intentioned ones, you know, we'll wait, your children will, will, will assimilate, uh, puts people's lives into these boxes that they have to wait. You know, their, their lives don't have a meaning until they give birth to babies who will then finally assimilate and will, will it, It's fulfill. the wait, waiting room concept waiting room, of life, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we are moving away from that. It's, mm. it's a healthy conversation to say that it will be, be de center the center, right? That, and I think the, the colleagues in German history, uh, German history became globalized and, yes. and actually helped help this process a lot. 